It's Friday night. Time for the evidence-based triathlete. Hey, Ted, how's it going? Good. How you going? Doing good. We're getting a little bit of rain on this side of town. I don't yeah, know. When I just uh, just drove home from work and the sky was ominous, which uh -huh. is you know it's kind of weird for Las Vegas. You know, we have so many sunny days to see it to, to see uh, the clouds that thick. I know this is probably one of maybe four days we'll have. <laughs> yeah, you know, know it's funny. Look like. It's like it's, it's you know winter is coming to to Las Vegas uh, for the next week. I was like, man, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much ready for a break, a training break. And I'm like, this might be a really good week just to, to, to drop back uh, the training load significantly, just because the weather is going to be bad. It's really hard to take a break when it's like 70 degrees oh, and sunny. And, you know, on Sunday, uh, last Sunday, I was going to do a three hour bike ride. And I got to the bottom of Mount Potosi and I was like, the weather was perfect. It was like 68 degrees, not a lick of wind. I'm like, I got to go to the top. Yeah, nice. I'm you like, know, it wasn't, it wasn't the plan, but it was just so nice. Like, how do you not do it? All right. right? Last week was beautiful. It was, yes. It was I am looking at next week. Next week is going to be a little chilly. So yep. in the forties, a lot of, a lot of rain, I guess, too. Maybe we need to go back and revisit our uh, podcast on how to stay warm. <laughs> or how to indoor train. <laughs> yeah. The how to indoor train. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so so let's uh let, let's talk tonight about something a little like we really haven't touched much on, and that is how to prepare and decide, I guess, how to prepare for uh, doing your first triathlon. Yeah, so, I, I, I'll tell you, we we have a lot of new people who came on in 2020 looking to do their first triathlon, and they weren't able to do it because of COVID-19. And so all those folks are still continuing, and we've actually gotten some new uh, round of people joining our Facebook page and looking at our tri club, uh, who are looking to do their first race as well. So this is timely to uh, to talk about. Getting yeah, I, I I think that you know the, with the, especially with the you know the bike boom that happened and the running boom mm -hmm. that happened. Um, I was actually thinking about it, you know, maybe duathlon is the, this is the year of the duathlon because many people weren't able to swim yeah. and, uh, but pretty much, you know, everybody that I know, uh, even that have been training, you know, there's a few people that I know as well that are trying to get ready for their first triathlon. They've been able to swim or they've been able to bike and they've been able to run. Um, you know, I mean, we talked about it already in the past that, you know, bikes were sold out all over and still there's a bike shortage, uh, going on. Um, so yeah, I think that I think this could be a big year for triathlon. I mean, we talked about it the other day that all the Ironmans uh, mm -hmm. were sold out. Many of the seventy point threes are sold out. So it could be, you know, the only thing people can do are local races, and uh, which is good because you know the one thing I wanted to talk about was, um, and maybe we can start out with this: is you do not have to do an Ironman, no, your first race. I was, you know, in, in my first Ironman, I was so shocked at the number of people that that was their first triathlon. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent years building up to that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that was the problem. I was, I was intimidated because of, <laughs> I knew what it was going to be like. These people are just like, wow, like this is, yeah, I'm doing one triathlon and it's going to be an Ironman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think either of us would advise that. Yeah. Uh, that scenario no no come to our tri club events there are sprint events yep. and uh, they're a good challenge and it's a great gateway into the world of triathlon and really it's a great you know we, we do four events uh the tri club does four events a year hopefully we do them this year yep. and uh they're really good to practice you know for the seasoned athlete to try out different things and for the new athlete it's a wonderful experience because we have just a, we have a smaller group uh, than, a, than a normal race would have. And so you're able to sort of get exposed to a triathlon without the, the hustle and bustle of a, of a big event. And there's a lot of support there. There's a lot of, you know, people are just in, in general, there's not much as much stress. It's nobody's a race for the year. So you know, if you have a question for somebody or you need help with something, people are gonna help you. You're not gonna mess up their mojo. Um, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think actually, if you think about it, that's the antithesis of an Iron Man. Yeah, right, right. But it's still it's the culture, you yeah. know. And so I think one of the things that that 
that draws me and others to Iron Man or Iron Distance is just that, you know, surrounding yourself of like-minded people. And, you know, even in our club races, that's what it is. It's, you know, like-minded people that, that want to enjoy doing three sports in, in one time. So, so yeah. let's talk about getting started because, yeah. it, you know, I imagine a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to do a triathlon and it's a, uh, it, it's a big goal, you know, a sprint rate. And, uh, and I will say, I do, you know, often have to correct people when they, when they say, oh, I did just a sprint. No, sprints are, are legitimate triathlons. And I'm very proud of a lot of the sprint races that I've done. Some of my favorite races are sprint races. So uh, I always, I, I always tell people this, I said, okay, if I was to do a half marathon, would you say that that's not good? If I didn't, if I did really good, I, I already just did a half marathon. A lot of people say like that. They don't say, oh, I did just, I just did a half marathon. Like they're really proud of that. The finishing time of a half marathon is very close to the finishing time of a sprint triathlon. Yeah, that's good. And so once you can kind of get that through to people and then also understand that the world triathlon series, which is basically like the highest level of triathlon, they mix it up between sprint distance and Olympic distance. Those Mm. are the two distances that they race. Those are categorically the fastest, best triathletes in the world. Yeah. And, you know, there was even talk at the next Olympics that there, it was going to be a sprint race instead of an Olympic distance race. Oh, really? Yep. And, you know, and it, and it still might, if there is an Olympics, it yeah. still might end up, they actually have not formally decided um, because I think of the, the, the COVID situation. Mm-hmm. Plus there's a, you know, there is the relay, which is even shorter. Oh yeah. All right. It's, it's super sprint distance. And, you know, so yeah, I, you know, and there's even for age groupers, there's a world championship in sprint distance. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. So if they're giving out a world championship medal, well, it's a real thing. That's right. Well, and right. what I like about the sprint distance is it's purely three sports. Yep. Whereas once you start going longer, well, now you've got to think a little bit more about hydration. You got to think a little bit more about nutrition. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, you got to think a little bit more about all those little details that will add up to, to a big thing. But in a sprint, it's, it's, it's swim and yeah. <laughs> and you know, I actually kind of wish that we lived in some, live somewhere that there'd be a sprint triathlon race every, every month, one a month. I would love to do like a series like that. And I know down in Southern California, they get close to that. They, you know, they start the first races start in February yep. and the last ones are in November. And so you could almost do a sprint, uh, a sprint a month or more than, than that. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it is definitely a challenge, but here's the nice thing about it as well. It's broken up that it's not this daunting challenge of doing the same thing for an hour and a half or an hour and 40 minutes, like, like a half marathon is if anything, you know, well, I think it's, a, it might actually be a little bit more of a mental challenge. Mm-hmm. But physically, it might, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's probably easier than doing a half marathon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, John, let's talk about your first, your, your first triathlon and uh, uh, maybe some of the, you know, your memories. Well, my first race was the American Steamship Triathlon, Buffalo, New York in 1985. And, you know, it's funny, I was swimming in college and I can't remember what what caused me to sign up for it? But I do remember seeing a flyer and saying, oh, that looks like a, a neat challenge. And I'd been biking a bit on my Schwinn Varsity yellow 45 pound steel bike. Uh, and I've, I've always done a little bit of running at that point and uh, obviously swimming with the swim team. And I said, oh, that'd be cool. And so I, actually, I signed up for it. And I, again, I don't know, I don't really know what drove me to sign up to it, other than it just seemed like a neat, a neat challenge. And but I remember the race pretty, pretty vividly. So what did you do? Do you remember? I mean, obviously it's a long time ago. Do you remember how you prepared? Well, I was young. So, um, my preparation was, uh, you know, swimming on the swim team and I was biking I was just in Buffalo, New York. And so I used to bike up to, um, Niagara falls on the Canadian side. And, uh, so are you in? yeah. And you know, now I, I should have double checked the mileage, but, it was probably 
30 miles round trip. And okay, I thought, that's oh, pretty yeah. good on a 45 yeah. pound bike. Yeah, that, yeah, it was all flat though. I mean, it was all flat. <laughs> so, uh, but it was, uh, I remember I actually back then to keep track of your distance, I had to put a um, uh, odometer on the fork. I don't know if you, if you ever use them that it sits on the fork and then as the wheel turns, it turns the odometer every you know, click every time. And it would basically count the number of wheel revolutions and that would tell you how far you uh, you went. So it was a manual odometer. Yeah. I, I, I've never seen one of those like that. I mean, obviously on a measuring wheel, I've seen yeah. that. Well, yeah. that's pretty cool. Oh, that was, that, that was neat. And yeah, a lot of times I, oh, this sounds terrible because this, maybe this is, I still do this. So, you know, get to Niagara Falls and have an ice cream cone and then. <laughs> it's the best thing you could possibly do. So let me ask you this then. So you were riding some and you obviously could swim because you're swimming in college. What yep. about the running? Because I know swimmers are inherently poor runners. I don't think I really ran much at all in prep for it. It was, uh, you know, just something that, you know, I, I would run a little bit, but never anything structured. Okay. And so let's see, 1985, I would have been mm -mm, 64. So uh, 21. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, still coming out of high school sports. So, uh, yeah. you know, just running, but not, um, I, I, I was not doing a plan, you know, uh, run, you know, weekly or, or what have you. It was just haphazard training. And, uh, and I, re and, and that's what I remember about the race was one, the swim was in Lake Erie in uh, off the uh, pier at Bethlehem Steel, and it was just murky, murky water, which is what we are used to now. Yeah. And it was cold and uh, no wetsuit, and uh, but got it done. And uh, I remember getting out, getting on the bike ride, and uh, just loving the bike ride. I was just having a ball. It was just so much fun, just uh, racing with all these other people. And uh, and then uh, then I got up, got to the run, and I remember that run. Uh, boy, my legs were just jello. They, uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't really even get into the groove of running, but I was just still loving it. I was just like, this is such a neat experience. I don't know. It was just a funny thing. It was, wasn't like it was painful, but it was, uh, I just remember how, how hard it was to, uh, to run. And then, uh, I, I finished and, uh, you know, got the results probably a month later because everything yeah. <laughs> and then I just remember pouring over the results and thinking, how can I go faster? How do I, you know, where, where can I pick up this time? And the analytical mind started working. Oh, totally. It was just, yeah, I, I was just, I was loving, you know, you had your swim, swim split, you had your transition split, you had your bike split, you had next transition, and then your, your run split. And I was just pouring over it and just loving it. And, uh, you know, then I was just thinking, how can I go faster? And, you know, that was back in the eighties. There wasn't a lot of information out there on it at that point, but I know. No, I, it's interesting you mentioned running. that. Cause I think that the sport of triathlon really the, the analytical person, yeah. like if you're an analytical person, it's the perfect sport for you because there's literally endless analysis that can be yeah. done. And, uh, you know, I, you're probably like me, like I go down rabbit holes of analysis sometimes still, no. And, uh, you know, well, if I did this, I would have been five seconds faster. And, you know, if I, well, all these ifs, which is, no. which is fun. Um, okay. Well, let's talk then. So you were young, which no. was, is, is, is definitely an advantage. Cause I'm, I, I also think like I didn't get into triathlon until later in life, but I think around 21, I could have done anything. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. And for sure. Like if I didn't even know triathlon existed when I was 21, but um, I think if someone would said, hey, there's a triathlon, you want to go do it? Yeah, I could. Because yeah. I, was, I was running back then. Right. And, I, and I did ride my bike to, to, to college a lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, and, I, and I knew how to swim. I wasn't very good, but I knew how. So I think I, I, think I would have really liked that uh, back then too. But you know, I was late into the triathlon game. And your second incarnation, you were late into the triathlon game as well. Right? So you were 40 when you kind of... Yeah, um, we came back. We took uh, basically a 14-year taper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had the two boys, and that that was our life. Was really you know pouring into uh, to family life, and I took a step back from uh, training, and 
and I, leading up until then, I, I trained pretty hard and uh, I, I pretty much overtrained and I, I needed a, I needed a big break after uh, a 14 year break. I needed a 14 year break. And uh, so, yeah, I came back in uh, 2007 and uh, yeah, the sport had changed by then. Yeah. <laughs> and you changed by then. I had changed by then. I gained a little bit more weight. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about getting ready for that first race. Yeah. Cause that's probably more realistic to where more of, more of our listeners are. Yeah. Is, is that so what did you do to kind of get ready, even though you had the understanding of what a triathlon was and yeah. kind of what to expect? What, what, well, and, what and at that do? point, I'd, I'd been teaching, you know, biomechanics and some ex-phys, uh, you know, teaching about training and, you know, I worked in cardiac rehab. And so, you know, I had some practical experience of creating training plans and what have you. And uh, so now I had a little bit of knowledge under my my belt. Uh oh, so, that's that, that's a that's a scary thing. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but I literally started out with very little running, but a consistent running. I mean, I, I literally was starting off with, I'm gonna go for a minute. I know it sounds so crazy, but I ran for a minute. I did the and same I go thing. for two minutes and then I work up to 10 minutes on running. I mean, I really, really took it slow getting in uh, and, and really, you know, because I, I was 216 pounds at that point. And so uh, a little, little bit more pounding and, uh, so yeah, no, but it really took, took it slow on the run. I started getting back on the bike and just trying to bike consistently. Um, and then, uh, swimming was probably the easiest to get back into. And, uh, I'd go in and, and really I started off swimming again, um, really just doing 500 yards at a time. And, and, and I know a lot of people are probably shaking their heads and saying, that's not a lot. And, but it was a lot for me, you know, again, coming back to it, I, because it, the last thing I wanted to do was get uh, over ambitious and then all of a sudden have an injury and, and work backwards. So uh, really just taking my time getting into it. So then with that knowledge, what advice would you give somebody that this is going to be their first? Like, what, what do you think is like a cornerstone piece of advice? Train consistently. And I know we, we did a podcast specifically on that. I think that's, that is the foundation, you know, trains uh, today. So you can train again tomorrow. Don't train today in a way that you have to take tomorrow off. There are times for that, but yeah, for sure. especially your first race or consistent training, regular training, that, that is uh, probably the, the best way to prep for your, for your first, first race. I couldn't agree more. I think one of the, the you know, the pieces of advice that I've, I've given many people is, Okay, your first triathlon, train consistently, do, do each thing twice a week to start. Mm -hmm. So yep. swim one day, bike one day, run one day, swim one day, bike one day, run one day, take a day off. And that's all you have. That's, that's literally all you have to do. And if you can only swim 500, because that's kind of where you, you fall apart, you do 500. If you can run a mile, you run, run a mile and do, do it at, you know, twice a week and slowly progress. You know, um, right now in my career uh, as a triathlete, I'm still slowly trying to progress. Mm -hmm. There's no big leaps. Yep. You know, you you mentioned it, like you didn't you didn't want to take a big leap and get injured. That's the key is is these slow, slow progressions. Mm -hmm. And you know, eventually you're going to get to a point where it's like, you know, what? I've I've increased these enough, and now I can add that seventh workout of the week. Still have a day off, but okay. On the day I swim, maybe I'm going to run afterwards. Yeah, you know, and I think that a lot of a lot of new people to the sport get overzealous and uh, try and do try and do too much, or on the other side, don't do nearly enough. Mm -hmm. Right, very few people. Uh, it's, and maybe it's a it's a human nature thing. Don't see the, the that that slow build. Yeah. You know? Um. It's kind of like, you know, when you were a kid and your parents, you know, at least my parents told me this, I'm sure yours did too, similar generation where they, you know, save a little bit of money, save a little bit. Uh -huh. And yeah. you start, you know, you know, a couple dollars a day, that's all it takes. And eventually you're going to have, you'll, you'll have some money in the savings account. It's the same with fitness. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's, it's the long game. No, and, I love it. And I think what also happens is as we become more experienced triathletes, 
is we forget how 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 good of a fitness uh, people have to be able to do these races. And so when someone new gets into it, uh, you, you sort of forget, oh yeah, we're going for a 20 mile ride. Well, that 20 mile ride is probably, you know, really far beyond what, what some people can start off with. And it is amazing, you know, if, if people listening to this podcast have done triathlon, it's pretty amazing what you're able to do. And uh, you've been able with to- With consistency. With what? With consistency. With consistency, that's right. Uh, and so it is, you know, it is fun to think back on, you know, when we did, when we weren't uh, as experienced, you know, just trying to, just trying to, to get started. Uh, anything is good. Any amount of training is good. No, it, it's so true. And, that, and then, and that's the best part too, though. Any amount of training is good. And any amount of training when you're new, you see really good results really fast. That's right. Right. Like for, for you now or me now, at the, the points where we're at, to make improvements takes, oh my gosh. Yeah. I can't even tell you if I wanted to drop, like in my half marathon time, if I wanted to drop two minutes, yeah. the amount of work yeah. that's going to be required for me to do that, mm -hmm. it's, it's hours and hours and maybe months mm -hmm. worth, of, worth of time. When you're new to drop two minutes and a half marathon, that could be two training runs. That's right. Right. So that's the that's the exciting part of being new to consistent yeah. training and to doing this is you will see really good gains. Mm -hmm. It's just like any other sporting activity or weightlifting or working at the gym. In the beginning, you see these almost astronomical gains. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'm going to tell people that I really think is important is just because you see these gains and these gains are possible doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing to do. And, and, you know, the people that I've worked with and that I've kind of advised, I say, Hey, listen, like, I know you can run 10 K, but you shouldn't. That's right. Right. Because you have not built up the resiliency in your connective tissue and your, in your tendons and your bones and your muscles to be able to do that. So let's take it slow. It's better to run 6K today and two days later, maybe run an 8K and mm -hmm. do one hit of 10K. Mm -hmm. And now I've got 14K instead of 10. And, you know, there's, there's, it's tough though, because when people are new, it's like, well, I want to push myself to my limit on every training. Yep. And really that's not the recipe for success. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the advice I'd give people at least is like, just because you can do something, doesn't mean you should. I love it. No, that 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 is spot on. I mean, that's really and and I love your your explanation that you're going to see big gains in the beginning, and then the gains they get a little smaller, and so you you've got to adjust your expectations. You can't just think you're going to keep improving at a linear rate. That's not how it is. It's uh, very non-linear in terms of uh, of improvement. Well, and then the problem is is like you know we've talked a little bit about homeostasis before, right? Because your body, that's the, it's the ultimate homeostasis machine, mm -hmm. right? If you train 10 hours a week at a certain, uh, certain, certain intensity and you only do that, you'll be able to do just that. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to do it all the time. Yep. But to ultimately make improvements, you're going to have to shock the system. You got to do something different. And that is, you know, in the triathlon world, that's either increasing intensity or increasing volume. Mm -hmm. Really, those are the only two two kind of levers we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to you have to make changes, and the key is is to not make those changes too quickly, or you break the levers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. It, and you know, we've talked about Hans Selye's stress adaptation model, which was never built. That model was never meant for for humans. It just happens to work out that way. Yeah, you've got to expose some stress then you adapt, but you need that recovery to allow for that ad adaptation. And if you don't follow that cycle all the way through, that's where you end up with the injury. So if you keep trying to stress, 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 you get a little, you get an adaptation, but eventually if you don't allow for rest and recovery, then, uh, then that's where that, that injury comes, comes back and, and uh, bites you. So John, let's talk, let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about, um, you know, some of the, I guess some of the fears that people have and some of the reasons that they would maybe say, I can't do it. I can't do a triathlon. Mm -hmm. So I see the number one, there's two really, I see number one is the swim. 
is just people are afraid of, especially open water swimming. Yep. You know, there is no touching the bottom. Um, so let's, we'll talk about that. But then I also want to talk about the fear of the bike mm -hmm. of like, you know, if someone hasn't ridden a bike in many years or have never ridden a bike before, how do we, you know, how do we get over that hump? So let's start with the, let's start with the swimming. So what would you, what, how would you advise somebody that maybe they go and they're, you know, they go to the, the gym and, you know, they get to the point where, you know, they can swim for like 20 minutes in the gym. Mm -hmm. How do you translate that into like, I'm going to the lake and I'm going to swim with, there's no lane line. There's no, there's no lifeguard necessarily sitting right beside me. How do you, how do you get past that? Well, I think it is important to recognize that it is a serious um, task that you're, you're going to undertake and do open water swimming in without getting too morbid. If, if someone's going to die in a triathlon, it's going to be in the swim. Uh, 80, 90% of the deaths are in the swim. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, the majority of the, the people who die in the swim die in the first 200 meters of the swim. And uh, there's a, you know, no one knows exactly what the reason is. Uh, there's underlying heart uh, problems that, that uh, people who've died uh, may have, uh, but there's, there's other things. There's anxiety, there's, you know, being kicked, there's the unfamiliar aspect of being in open water. Uh, and you, you combine all those things and um, you, you could, you know, take in water and all of a sudden uh, be in, in, in real danger. So I think respect to swim is important. Agreed. And as such, uh, getting out to open water and practicing is probably the best thing that people can do to alleviate their fears. I've taken a number of people down to the lake and uh, will swim with them, especially on their first swim, because they're, oh, yeah, I can do this. And then once we get going, if they've never been out in the open water before, it's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of anxiety that comes out when all of a sudden they realize how far they are. Uh, out and that they can't touch. And, um, and so it is, it is important to uh, practice and to practice safely with other people. Uh, maybe uh, get a, a swim buoy that is very popular to swim with now or to have a support kayak. Uh, now as a tri club, we do these things. Uh, hopefully we'll have them soon uh, where, where we'll provide all that. Uh, but it is important to respect the swim. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I love the idea of the swim buoy. Mm -hmm. So for people that don't know, uh, it's basically just a little tether system. So it's like a little tiny belt you put around your waist and you just drag this buoy and it's filled with air. And if, so if you get into trouble, first of all, it lets other people know you're around because it's they're fluorescent. So if like a boat or something is around, they can see it. But secondarily, like you can stop and you can hold on to it and it'll keep you up. It's kind of like a life, uh, a life vest that you're, you're kind of dragging along with you, but there's very little actual drag to it. So it really doesn't affect your, affect your swimming. The other cool thing is, is most of them have a little dry, dry bag things with them. So you can put your car keys or something in it as well. Yep. Um, so if you're down at the lake, I think that's really good. And the other thing I, you know, I always advise people, is especially if you go down to the lake, we're lucky here where you could actually swim at least at Boulder beach where you could touch. Mm -hmm. yeah, so say, right. hey, I don't want, I only want you to swim where you could see the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps with anxiety. Even if they can't touch, if you can still see the bottom, there's something psychologic there, right? Mm -hmm. When you get out a little deeper and you can't see the bottom anymore, I think that messes with people. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I was reading a few stories about people at Ironman Arizona who that this was their first triathlon. Oh. And you get into that water at six in the morning even at high noon, you cannot see your hand. No. The water is so dark and murky. And they, I was reading some articles, they're they basically talking about people that didn't make it to the start. Because mm -hmm. it's a 200 yard swim to the start. Yeah. If they just get so much anxiety and fear. Yeah. Um, but you, but you, 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 you have to understand the human psych, psyche here that we can build up into that, mm -hmm. right? And there are, there are ways to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage people like you to get out to the lake, mm -hmm. you know, with a group, um, you know, preferably some people that uh, have been out there before and, and uh, you know, swim with it, swim with a group, have a swim buoy. The other thing I say, and this is obviously this time of year, is, as we start into this, hopefully soon, um, a wetsuit. Yeah. Uh, you, if you, if you're, if you've never swam in a wetsuit, obviously swim in a wetsuit before you go to a race with a wetsuit, 
but a wetsuit is just, it's a big life preserver mm -hmm. I mean, you flip on your back and you're in a wetsuit you're not going to sink at least i don't think you are no nope. it holds me up i don't know about you if i'm on my back my head stays above the water for sure yep no it's uh the neoprene is definitely uh adds in buoyancy and that that's one of the reasons people get it the one problem is, is when water really starts to get inside the wetsuit. Even yep. though it's a wetsuit and it's designed that you get wet, uh, once you get a lot of water in the wetsuit, it can actually uh, end up really uh, making it harder to uh, stay afloat. That's, that's true. Yeah. So, well, I guess that, you know, that would have something to do with the fit of the wetsuit too, right? Make mm -hmm. sure yeah. that you have a proper fitting wetsuit. And, and that can be difficult because, you know, uh, when I started out, uh, Swim 2000, there was you could go and try on wetsuits and, and rent them. And at first, I rented wetsuits. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if they still do that, but that was big because you could go try it on. No, I don't think we have anywhere local. Every now and then, I'll take our... We, we do a lot of research with wetsuits. And I'll, I'll post, uh, hey, I'll take all the wetsuits down and do a wetsuit try-on day. And people are more than welcome to come out and, come out and try them on. Yeah. Because it is, it, it, you do have to see which wetsuit model fits you, what wetsuit size. You know, all these manufacturers have several. So it's not just small, medium, large, extra large. Small, tall, small, yeah. short. Yeah. All over the place. And trying to figure in, figuring out which one is best for you is, it's not easy. And especially if it's not, it's not easy if you can't put it on and try it. So, um, you know, watch for when we say there's a, if you're looking for wetsuit, watch for um you know a post where we'll we'll take a whole bunch down yeah, or buy sure. from a company that that uh takes the, the wet tube back so yeah so um there are several companies out there that you can buy them online and you can swim in them for like 30 days and send them back if they if it doesn't work for yeah. you so i mean i would definitely encourage that oh i throw out another thing same with running shoes mm -hmm. there are several companies that will let you have the shoe for somewhere up to 60 days and if, and if it doesn't work, you can send it back. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a good thing. So, okay. I think we did a pretty good job of talking about that. So let's talk so about the, let me have one, let me have one more. Yep. get good goggles. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And don't be afraid to change your goggles out. You, you should be able to see and they should not leak. Yes. So, and if your goggles leak, you've got the wrong pair. Don't buy the same brand. Try a different brand. If yeah, you're, you're, you're not right. foggy or you can't see, get a different, get a new pair. Yeah. And if you have to tighten them down so you can, you can, you know, it's basically sucking your brain out. It's the only way you can get them not to leak. That's the wrong pair for you. That's right. They should be comfortable and you do not need to be in pain when you're swimming with your goggles. <laughs> yeah. That's good to know. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, one other thing is swimming at the lake. Uh, it's, it's best practice to wear a swim cap yep. that's, that's colorful. So even if you're in the swim area, having something that is colorful is a good idea because there are boats and jet skis and stuff like that. So, Well, okay. I actually wrote that one down too. Boy, hopefully we get past the swim here. Uh, okay. I wrote down cap as well because you do need to get used to swimming in a cap. Yeah. And so if you go to a race and you, you're, it's the first time that you know, you're going to put a cap on, you're going to feel very awkward because uh, the water does flow over your goggles differently yep. and can actually flow over your face differently. So then you're, even your breathing ends up being a little bit different. So practice being in your cap as well. Yeah. Okay. Let's do, let's do talk about the bike. Okay. Because, you know, John, I think that once again, our generation, we grew up riding bikes. Yeah. Like, it was the, like, I don't know a kid that I grew up with that didn't know how to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. We had a little bike gang around the neighborhood, you know, and, but today there's a lot of kids that don't ride bikes. And then that's now translating into a lot of teenagers that don't ride bikes. So, you know, if you were to ask, for example, your class at the university, how many of you actually could go and ride a 10 speed? I'm not saying a beach cruiser. I'm saying, right. can you go and actually get on a 10 speed and ride it? I'm going to say there would be a per, there would be a significant percentage that would be very scared mm -hmm. yep. to actually get on the bike. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I never really truly understood that because like I grew up riding bikes and it was just you just get on the bike and go. But I've seen uh, at a lot of these like entry level triathlons, people just very nervous being on a bike. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're going to see more of this, unfortunately, because 
of the indoor training. Yeah. Right. So everybody and their mom has a Peloton or now, right? Well, there's no skill on a Peloton, right? So, or they've done spin class. Like I have lots of friends that they go to spin class all the time. And now they do spin classes at home with their Pelotons. That doesn't mean you can ride a bike. Yep. You know, and definitely you probably can't ride a bike when your hands are really cold and you're wet and you know, there's other people around you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make the suggestion that you need to get outside on a, on the bike you're going to ride in the, in, in the triathlon and spend a significant amount of time getting comfortable on the bike, you know, so you can change the gears, you know, how to change the gears, you know, how to brake. you know, how to balance, you know, how to take your foot off the pedal, you know, you know, you know how to do those basic things and you're comfortable with it. You can turn to the left, you can turn to the right. And we as experienced triathlons take that, tri tri triathletes take that for granted. I, mm -hmm. At least I think so. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, I think, I think having, you know, we talk about bike handling skills and that's, you know, a you know, way to, to, you know, sort of put everything into one big bin, but it's really, you know, like you said, how to balance the bike, how to stop, how to put your foot down. Uh, you know, how to turn, you know, we, had, we did a member spotlight uh, last night with a, a motorcyclist and he talks about counter steering and, you know, I, believe it or not, we actually counter steer in, in uh, turning our bikes. It's a funny, um, funny process of actually turning a bike. It's not, if you really take a step back and try to understand the physics of turning a bike, it's not as simple as I'm going to turn the wheel this way. Yeah. It's not how it works. So <laughs> in reality, I don't know if you guys talked about it and get a chance to listen to it. You probably don't actually turn the steering wheel more than one or two degrees at any. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. At any and, time. Okay. Just for fun. Don't yeah. do this if you're new, but if you're, if you can ride go hands on your bike, what uh, you can, I know, I'm going to say this and people are going to crash and now I'm going to get in trouble. But if you go down and, and you push your right side of your handlebar, try to push that to turn left, you actually won't turn left. And really? you are quickly have to grab your handlebars. Yeah. 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 So try it. And, uh, don't crash though. Okay. So this is actually my, my little shame thing. I am, I am a horrible rider with no hands. Mm -hmm. Like I definitely cannot do it on my triathlon bike. It's a little harder on a tri bike because you're at a very steep angle. When I say steep angle, the seat tube is you know very near vertical. Well, and the wheelbase is shorter. That's right. That's true. And yeah. and so those two things, um, it, it's not the, the bikes are not really you know designed to ride without hands. So and and even my my road bike, I, I like to take a vest off or something. I don't like that. It yeah. makes me very nervous. And I and I'm I've logged thousands, tens yeah. of thousands of hours on that bike. And I still I don't like it. So well, and, and I think this in, in terms of the skill set, I think it's good to be able to ride with one hand yes, on your sure. uh, on your handlebars and being comfortable that way because we start going through aid stations and having to pick things up or drop things off. Or even just getting a bottle out of your own bike. That's right. That's right. So, and, and I think that's a skill that, that people really should practice, uh, looking over your shoulder, I think is a, okay. uh, another really big, really one. good skill. And again, this is one of those non-intuitive things. If you want to look over your left shoulder, you think you drop your left shoulder. You don't, you drop your right shoulder. So as you're riding, if I want to look left, I drop my right and that allows me to turn so I can see over my left shoulder. Don't drop your left shoulder, drop your right yeah. shoulder. And the other thing that inherently happens is you look behind you and then you start going that way. Yes, yeah. Right? And so you gotta, you gotta know, like when you look this way, you still kind of you know, aim a little bit right or you next thing you know, you're in the middle of the road. And, um, but all these are little things that you pick up mm -hmm. you know, by, by, by getting, out, getting outside yep. in the real world. Yeah, you know, if I could give people advice, I mean, at least get on the bike paths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and, and start there. Cause if you're nervous around traffic, like, please, like, you know, get on the, get on those. I would also say, get into some big parking lots, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and just set yourself up so you can practice turning. That's great. Practice, practice yeah. some sharp turns and, and just doing a parking lot. And you know what, 
I hate to say this, you might fall. Yep. You know, well, actually in biking, you will fall. There's two kinds of cyclists, yep. those who have fallen and those who will. Yep. <laughs> so I mean, we talked about this before in a podcast. We've I've fallen off my bike, shoot, yep. too many times. Mm-hmm. And but it, unfortunately, you will fall. Okay. So that brings us to the helmet. Yep. You've got to have a helmet. You got to wear a helmet. Now, I don't think that anyone's really re- resistant to it. Although with the pandemic starting, I did see a lot of old timers get on the bike and they were not wearing helmets. Because back in the 80s, we didn't, yeah. wear, we didn't wear helmets when uh, we went training. So, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'm going to be the helmet salesperson. I have crashed, like seriously crashed twice. Mm-hmm. Both times, the helmet absolutely made a difference. Yeah. Mm. and i can remember smacking my head both times and mm-hmm. both times saying wow like i'm okay like i was a little shaken up yeah but if yep. my head would have hit what my helmet hit yep. i would have been in some serious peril and um you know i don't know obviously we haven't talked much about it but you know one of my areas of, of expertise is teaching about concussion and management of concussion and you know, one of the things we talk about in a lot of sports is that, you know, helmets don't really make much difference in concussion, but we're not talking about 35 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour hitting, hit, hitting the, hitting the ground. And, um, I'm telling you, I've broken a helmet by hitting my head on the ground and I was not concussed. Wow. And then, then I'm going to add to this. We talked about the helmet safety before, mm-hmm. um, but don't, don't cheap out on a helmet, like no, buy a good quality helmet and you know and and all it takes literally is one time you hitting your head on the ground really hard so hard that you break your helmet that you're going to think that you think yourself that you paid more for your helmet and you bought a quality helmet that's a wonderful point and and inspect your helmet because actually i have to replace mine because the back part of this system snapped yep yep at that point it's no good it, it, it absolutely, it's not going to protect you to nearly to the extent it was, it was designed to. And then make sure your strap is correctly set up. Yep. So I always get a little bothered when people, they have this part of the strap hanging down around here. It's like, you should be able to put two fingers in between yep. your chin and your strap. Now, if you're a cyclist, then your glasses go over but during a race, your glasses go under the strap so that you can take off your helmet without losing your glasses. <laughs> there you go. But you got to take the time to set these up, uh, you know, so that they're comfortable, that you have the one strap going behind the ear, the other strap coming over in front of the ear. Uh, and, and, it, and it has to be comfortable. It can't be. Same thing as goggles. If, it, if it's causing you pain, it's not the right helmet. I, I could not agree more. And so, yeah, I, I think that, that the, all these points are, 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 are very valid. Um, and for all of these things, guess what? You all, you all that are listening to this, you get a resource, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, you can get onto the Las Vegas Triathlon Club's page and ask questions. Yep. You know, uh, there are very many knowledgeable people. Uh, I guarantee you, if I was to have some stranger post, Hey, I live in the Northwest of Las Vegas. I'm having trouble fitting my helmet. Can anybody help me? There'd be 12 people that say, Oh yeah, come on over. Like, let's meet at this park. I'll help you. That's the community we're living in. And people say, Oh, there's no community in Las Vegas. There is. You just, you know, and and it's there. And there've been people that have asked questions like that on our Facebook page before. Yeah, no, I I love seeing everyone respond when uh, people reach out for help because you do. I actually learn things. I'm like, oh, that's a cool way to do that. So yeah, no, it, it is really, we've got, a, we've got a wonderful endurance community here. Okay, how about pedals and shoes? What do you- Oh my gosh, you John, know? you're really getting into it. Uh, I would say for a first triathlon, you should have, you should wear your running shoes on the bike and run and ride in just normal, we call them flat pedals, yep. but just pedals with nothing, nothing fancy to them, literally just flat pedals. Um, you know, it's interesting, obviously, one of our grad students is doing some research on this right now, but there really is not a lot of evidence that there's a, a big difference between flat pedals and being clipped in. And mm-hmm. especially when we're talking about a triathlon, that's going to be, you know, like maybe 12 miles in a sprint mm-hmm. race. Yeah. 
you know, that would be my, my, my advice would be not, don't mess around. Now, if you're a trained cyclist and you're used to wearing uh, cycling shoes and clip-in pedals, absolutely go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. But if this is kind of your first foray into it, and it's going to help you down the road too, because you're not going to have to change out of those shoes into running shoes to run anyways. So that would be my advice. Oh, I love it. And, and old school, I mean, that's what we used to do. We, you know, bike in our uh, running shoes and with the toe clips and then run in the running same shoes. And so uh, I actually, I, I am going to try, if we're able to race, uh, I'm going to do one of our sprints with flat bottom pedals. Yeah, why not? Of our running shoes. I, I want to do that. Because, yeah, we've got one of our grad students doing her thesis on this. So uh, it's, it's brought back memories and, and I think it's, it's worth uh, trying. Dang it. You're going to. So for those of you that don't know, when John and I race, oftentimes it's about transition to where we meet up. <laughs> so now John's going to be able to out of transition to just a little bit faster. That's a, that's a problem. We'll, we'll get to swim as long as possible. Then I can at least get out of transition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, okay, so the last thing is, uh, I don't think we really need to spend too much time talking about the run, but I think we should talk really briefly about the transitions. Okay, well, actually with the run, I think we need to mention, because you, you were talking about things people are afraid of. A lot of people okay. are afraid of injuries. Yes. And the stats bear out that triathletes are susceptible at the same rate of running-related injuries as marathoners. And so it is something you need to pay attention to with, uh, with your running and, and be mindful of, uh, of, of creating a plan that, that is not going to uh, increase your risk of injuries. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. That's, that's a good thing to, to bring up. But I will also tell you this, in a triathlon, nothing says you can't walk. Yep, yep. Right? If, you're, if it's your first triathlon and you want to run a mile, then walk a mile, then run the last mile, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. You're still going to finish. You'll, you'll finish. You'll be a triathlete. You'll have done your first, first event. There's no shame in that at all. Um, you know, we talked about the run walk uh, several weeks ago as well. You know, like, like here's the thing, like it is a thing that you, it, it, it's a, it's a technique that we can use. And I fully encourage people to do that. Well, we talk about walking the aid stations and make sure that you get the aid. I mean, that, that, that is uh, a lot of times part of your pacing strategy is to incorporate some walks. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So let's talk transitions then. I yeah, think so so for, for people that don't realize we've been, we talk about it. So you ubiquitously, mm -hmm. um, but there are two transitions. It's the transition from going from swimming to biking and from biking to running. Transition one is the is what we call the, the first one, and I I believe that transition one is is the more difficult of the two, because you're wet, your hands might be really cold, your feet might be really cold. So for your first triathlon, I'm going to tell you this: take your time in transition one. You know, it's not uncommon for people to bring like a painter's bucket, mm -hmm. you know, five gallon bucket. So you just flip it upside down, sit down. Take your time, put socks on, put your shoes on, have a towel, maybe dry off, make sure your feet are clean. So you don't put them, you know, you don't have little rocks and pebbles in your shoes. Um, have a drink, mm -hmm. calm down just for a second. You know, in your first triathlon, you're not, in my opinion, you're not there to, to win it, mm -hmm. right? You're there to gain experience and, so just be methodical, have a plan, even practice that plan. That's another big thing is practice doing this. Um, but, but don't rush transition one. Maybe that's, that's my best advice for you. Now transition two, when you're going from biking to running, I will tell you this, do not come in hot. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a, there is a mount line. So when you get on your bike, there's a line that says you can get on your bike here. There's a dismount line oh. you have to get off your bike. And there's usually people saying, slow down, slow down, dismount here. I have raced 75 triathlons approximately. Yep. I never come in hot. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, I've never missed that line, mm -hmm. right? So take your time, like the two or three seconds you're going to gain by slowing down and getting off the bike in control will save you a lot of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. 
I can't tell you how many people I've seen crash going into transition two and fall over and, uh, you know, just all sorts of problems, skidding you know, with yeah. the brakes. And so just take it easy coming into, into that. But I, other than that, in transition two, I think that one is the one you can be quick because you just rack your bike, especially if you have flat pedals. Rack your bike. Oh, don't forget to take your helmet off. Because yeah. we've seen we've all seen people running out of the transition zone with their helmet still on. Yeah. Don't forget that. Grab your run number, put it on if you don't already have it on, and you're gone. It's quick. But yeah. it's the transition one, I think, that is the is the issue. Yeah. Now I, I will say uh, I agree hundred percent with take your time, be be mytholo mythological, be deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> but my smallest margin victory was one one hundredth of a second so but remember we're not trying to win we're trying to complete right. our first triathlon that's right so uh, i want to go back to uh, t1 uh, especially local races or whatever race you go to you need to inspect uh getting out of the water yep. and where your bike is and you need to know whether or not you might leave footwear uh, on the exit and, uh, you know, we, we, you know, Lake Mead, we've had some years where the water is pretty low and uh, running up the beach is not, you know, it's Boulder Beach, you know, it's rocky. So, uh, so a lot of us got into the habit of putting shoes down there or something uh, to put on to run up to our, to our bike, which could be, you know, quarter mile run. Uh, and so you wanna, you wanna look at that. You wanna know the rules of trend, uh, transition in terms of uh, once you once you take your bike off the rack, your helmet should be on. Uh, so get your helmet on before you take your bike off uh, the rack and keep your helmet on until you rack your bike. Uh, races are all a little bit different, but uh, that's, a, that's a general uh, way to do it. Uh, for T1, know how to get out of your wetsuit and practice that ahead of time. If this, you know, if you're not if you haven't done a lot of swimming in the wetsuit, uh, that this is really critical to make sure you know how your zipper works and how uh, how to undo the wetsuit in order to to uh, get out of it to be able to get ready for uh, uh, for the bike. Yeah. But yeah, I agree with you. Don't you know come into the T two uh, fast. Uh, you're you're not you're not going to be saving yourself much and. And uh, that is where you can see some accidents uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the, the last piece of advice that I would have is just to tell people that it's, it's, it's a challenge. Doing your first triathlon is a challenge, but it is doable. And I'm going to say it's doable for 95% of the people out there. Mm -hmm. There are some people that, you know, with medical conditions and, you know, maybe they just can't do it. But I'm, I'm, I've seen some, some, some people that you'd look at on the street and like, oh my gosh, I can't, there's no way they could do a travel on. They did it. Yeah. Right. I can still remember uh, we were, it was the first year we went to St. George to the 70.3 and we we're on the bus. It was you know, five o'clock in the morning heading out to Sand Hollow. There's a guy sitting across from me, 430 pounds. And he was doing his first 70.3 and he'd done multiple sprints, multiple Olympic races. He'd already lost 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. He had a special made bike for himself and, you know, and triathlon was changing his life. And I, I still, the conversation with him is, just, you know, this is like eight years ago now. It's still, I still think about this. And, you know, and, and he said to me, he's like, listen, listen, like if I can do it, anybody can. And I'm trying to inspire others. And, and, and it's true, you know, you know, was he, was he the fastest? No, but he was completing these races. Yeah. And that's the, be that's the beauty of triathlon. If you ask me is it's all shapes and sizes out there. And, and I gotta, you know, there are a few judgmental people, but in general, people don't judge, you yep. know, we're all out there in Lycra and, you know, goofy, goofy sunglasses and goofy looking bikes. Look at that crazy bike you got on your wall. And yeah. You know, it's, it is what it is. It's, it, it, you know, we're all doing it for our own reasons. And I, you know, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that given the right preparation and the right advice, anyone can do it. No, I agree. And, and it is, 
you know, a, a huge accomplishment to, to do a, a triathlon because it is combining three sports. Yeah. But I have, to, I have to back up just for a second because actually I'm seeing a comment on our Facebook page and we missed a really critical thing to talk about for T2. And that's um, your bike shoes and uh, run shoes. But I was assuming they were on the same shoes. Okay, so if, I, I agree. If it's in your, if you're in your first race, you're biking in your run shoes, yep. and so then it's easy. But if you're biking in bike shoes, you do need to be careful if you're trying to run in yep. your bike shoes because it's plastic. You should practice. You should practice that. Yeah, and it, and you, you do need to be careful. And you got to, and even in T1, you've got to. Now, you know, some people progress to keeping their shoes clipped in and then trying to get their uh, feet in the shoes while they're pedaling. I wholeheartedly disagree with that, especially down at Boulder Beach, because your first part of the, the segment is uphill. And you're just trying to keep your balance at first. And it's going to be really hard to try to put get your feet in your shoes if your shoes are on your pedal. And so that is something for elite yeah. age groupers. Long, and I still don't. I, in T1, I always put my uh, shoes on, um, and then then I go to the to uh, to the mountain line. I know there's a lot of people who go the other route, but I, me, I don't risk it. Yeah. For and me, the, I, I risk it if the profile is right. Yeah. So if yeah. The, if Boulder, the, I'm talking specifically about Boulder Beach. Yeah, I would never do it there. Yeah. No, because it, it's not the right course for for. But it's Sand Hollow. I would, because it's yeah. a downhill. It's a downhill. And you can't go that fast in the beginning anyways. So no, yeah. that's good. And then getting off uh, again, you know, something as you, as you get more experience, you can get your feet out of the shoes and then just have your feet on top of the shoes and leave the shoes clipped in. If you've got clipped platforms, we'll do, we'll, we'll do a video of a, a flying dismount. I think that'd be good, you know, uh, because that is, that is a little bit more advanced. I would not be talking with a new triathlete about doing something like that, no, no, but no. I would be talking with, if they are wearing bike shoes of any type, uh, get off the bike and you're more walking rather than running. Yeah. Uh, it's a quick walk. Bike shoes. So. Yeah. Great, great comment. Yeah. So, yeah, this has been good. And, and I agree with everything you said and, and um, you know, surround yourself with the right people uh, because your first race, you don't necessarily need a lot of training detail. You mostly just need to be exposed to uh, getting fit and, you know, surrounding yourself with the right group of people is, uh, is really important. And, getting out for group swims and group bike rides and even group runs is just okay so it's COVID-19 we still got to be careful with the group stuff but uh but it is um you know it, it it is a way to surround yourself with the right people and uh have the right mindset and before you know it you'll be crossing that first line for finish line exactly all right well that was really good yeah what do you got going on this weekend well it's raining right now. I got to check the weather. We are going to do a bike ride tomorrow morning, but uh, got to see what uh, see what the weather is going to be holding up. Because, yeah, I tell you, we, we're we're so spoiled. If it rains, uh, I, I tend not to ride outside because it's only going to rain for a day or two, and then. Uh, back so up. I I actually it's interesting. I make a point to ride in the rain because I've had to race in the rain. Yeah. And if you never ride in the rain, yeah. it is not a good. thing. It's not comfortable, but I do not make it a point to ride in the rain when it's 40 degrees outside. Yeah, that's so I save that for the summer, for the monsoons. And yeah. you know, it's a warm, warm weather uh, rain that I like to do. So that, that actually sounds like fun. Yes, I, I enjoy it. Like, you know, in this middle of the summer, we get a thunderstorm come through and it's raining yeah. and get out, go for a ride and steam's coming up off the, yeah. I mean, off the pavement. I like that for sure. I love it. I love it. You got anything going on this weekend? No, not too much this weekend. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to try and take it, take it easy. I, you know, typical tomorrow, swim, run, yep. Sunday, go for a bike ride. I'm, I'm looking at maybe going out to Indian Springs or something for my bike ride. If, you know, depending on the wind, if not, I'll be Zwifting, uh, riding indoors, um, wow. and just trying to, just trying to keep a, a little bit mellow right now. You know, the, I started to map out my season and, <laughs> My fall is ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, I've got, you know, three world championships and a full Ironman uh, between August and October. 
Oh goodness. And so I told myself, you know what, Ted, you need to, you need to back it off a little bit right now. And cause it's going to get crazy. So, yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully I'm, you know, knocking on woods, it gets crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's right. That's right. I'm, I am really, I missed racing last year, but uh, as, as a lot of us have, but I really am uh, missing racing right now. So uh, looking forward to that first race. I think that's going to be a, a big celebration. So. so, and just, you know, for the people that are still listening, uh, the 14th of February, uh, we are doing a time trial yep. at Red Rock. And uh, I kind of made the decision today, since I'm the one that kind of hosts these things, uh, we'll do a duathlon. Oh, so nice. I like we'll that. We'll have a 5K run after. Because uh, right. I know a lot of people are missing racing. And, you know, um, I was looking at a few of the local 5Ks they're starting to do. And, and, and honestly, like I get people have got to make money and these are businesses, yeah. but $50 to run a 5k to me, like, yeah. hey, I'm not a cheap guy, but like, that's, yeah, I am a little bit. Marie, my wife just listened and said, yeah, you are. Um, well, you know, but, I, I, I will tell you permits can be expensive. So when you're actually yeah. running a race. No, I, I get it. I get it. But it, it's still like, to me, like psychologically, like, yeah. You know, I used to run these Las Vegas tra track club races that were five dollars. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not even that long ago. That was like seven years ago. Yeah, right. And and I also understand a lot of these five Ks are for charity, and I and I and I and I get that. But I was like, well, why don't we just do something with the tri club and just have a? You could do either. You could do the, you could do the you could do the five K. You could do the bike, or you could do both and make it a duathlon. one. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're gonna host that on the fourteenth for uh, Valentine's. The Heartbreaker, we call it the Heartbreaker Duathlon. I like it. Yeah. So keep that in mind for the people who are still following along. Yeah. And uh, I see a comment Rage is going to be their uh, first race. And uh, remember, we'll do the Tri Club race the week before Rage. Yeah. So you can practice uh, that course before you actually go and, uh, and do it. So, yeah. Yeah. This is fun. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Well, Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks. I better go check on my trailer. <laughs> Make sure it's not wet. <laughs> Make sure it's not leaking. All, All right. right. Talk yeah. to you later. Bye bye.